Cindy, hi, hello, and welcome to the Female Startup Club podcast. Hi, how's it going? Oh, you know, lockdown, London, over it. <laughs> How are you going? I'm fine. I'm, I'm staying optimistic, I'd say. Um, things are looking up in New York, which is more than I can say a month ago. So that's a good step, right? Totally. Great place to be. Great mindset to have. Do you want to introduce yourself for those who might not know you yet and what your business actually is? Sure. Yeah. I'm Cindy Ramirez Fulton. I'm the founder and CEO of um, a company called Chill House. And we are the uh, authority of modern self-care. Um, so what that means is we have a, basically a 360 outlook on um, giving people um, ways to practice self-care regularly. So we have a physical space in Manhattan's Soho area, um, our flagship location. And out of that space, we do a huge, a large suite of services ranging from uh, manicures, massages to, um, uh, sorry, manis, pedicures, massages, uh, facials, and um, we have a wellness cafe and we also have an infrared heat studio um, room. And um, additionally, we also have products. So you can kind of visit our web store, chillhouse.com and either shop um, Chill House products or uh, third party products that can basically just bring you from feeling like meh to feeling really good. <laughs> so it's really just about um, creating um, experiences, products and um, content that make people feel good on the regular and chill. Gosh, so needed at this time in the world and what's going on. And my God, I cannot wait to get a massage and a mani and a pedi when things go back to normal. <laughs> Holy moly. Let's go back to life before Chill House. What was sparking that, you know, idea in you to bring this vision around attainable self-care and modern self-care to life? The story is, it's one of those like, oh my God, I need this sort of stories. Um, but I guess kind of back it up even further. My mom's an esthetician. So I think subconsciously, I always kind of knew, um, I, I was ingrained in the space. I was, I grew up watching my mom sort of run her Medi spa and she was more focused on maintenance and, and upkeep. And, um, that obviously as a young woman, I didn't really like find that appealing to me. Cause I was like, okay, I don't really need stuff for cellulite. I don't really need stuff for like anti-aging. Um, these are services. And so I think in some way, shape or form, while I was watching her, I was also shaping, forming my own opinions on what I wanted. Um, fast forward, obviously, many, many years later, um, my husband and I were trying to get massages in Manhattan and kind of one day it just hit us that we didn't love what our options were. Um, at the time, it was, you know, even now, aside from Chill House, your options are, were either you spent, um, you know, kind of like, a, an obscene amount of money for um, a 60 minute massage, or you ended up somewhere kind of weird, sketchy in like a basement with, you know, you don't know who you're going to get, what kind of therapist you're going to get. Um, and, you know, at a very, very cheap price point, and that didn't really sit well with us either. So we were, we kind of just realized that there was something missing um, somewhere in the middle where I didn't feel guilty getting a massage in either capacity. Um, and then we kind of talked a little bit more, just developing the concept a bit more. Cause I, I am not one, I, I like doing a little bit more than one thing. I'm not one to do just one single service. So I was like, I don't massage isn't what I want to do ultimately as like the only thing chill house does. Like what else can we bring to the table? What else is missing? And, you know, as someone that practice self-care in a way regularly, but like wanted a more like ex experience based um, place to go. Like manicures are one of those things that I got weekly. I mean, my manicure is terrible right now. I've been, <laughs> I've been uh, putting my tips on and off, so I don't have anything going on right now. Um, but yeah, so manicures are one of those things that I wanted to, that I got regularly and I never found a place that had um, like a, a fun experience attached to it. You know, it was very much like, here you go, go get your nails done. If it's an, it was a, if it was a high end place, maybe I would get a, a tea offered to me or a champagne offered to me, but it wasn't, 
There was nothing further than that. Um, so it realized, it dawned on us that there wasn't a hospitality element to any of these spas or, you know, salons as well. So we started like basically putting all of these things together, all these things that we love together, which is um, beverages and for me, manicures and then massages. And so um, the first location was those three things. It was cafe, manicures, massages. Um, and then we just evolved the brand from there. It, you know, I think what we realized is that people were just really excited to see what we came up with and what we were able to offer them from an experience standpoint, but also from like a digital standpoint, because there were people that just were really um, kind of gravitating to the brand just because of what we represented, right? We were fun. We, I mean, we are fun. You know, we're, we're, we don't take ourselves too seriously. We talk about um, self-care from a very holistic standpoint where it's not just about how do you spend all your money towards services. It's it's more so about just how do you make sure you're thinking about yourself regularly and here are all the ways that we can help you achieve that goal. Um, and yeah, so it has evolved obviously way past those three things. And, and, and the concept is so funny how it started there, but it really now is like taking on a life of its own. Totally. I can really see that as well in all the things you're coming out with and just the whole vibe around it. It's so amazing. I really love the chill times and the kind of content that you're publishing online for people who are on the other side of the world that love the brand and followed you on Instagram and then are like, cool, I want to read about this stuff too. Um, and I want to talk about your branding for a hot second because obviously it is such a special part of what you're doing with the business and especially, you know, from what I can see about the space and when you step into the the space, it's just so incredible. How did you approach the look and feel for the space? And was that, was it like that from the very beginning or has that evolved too? I say the look and feel definitely has evolved. Um, the first location feels totally different than the second one, but I think the brand as a whole has stayed pretty consistent as far as how I envisioned it. I think the first space um, wasn't fully representative of what the brand like could be, um, which is why now we're like very excited about the flagship. I feel like it's like our, we've like grown into it. Um, when people come to, New York City, they go to Chill House and it's like, oh, this feels like it, it matches the Instagram versus the other one. It was like, people were like, it's so small or like, I didn't realize it was going to be like this on this block. You know, it was the perception wasn't fully aligned. Um, so I'd say the flagship definitely is very much representative of the whole brand. Um, but as far as the look and feel, I mean, I definitely had a vision for how I wanted it to look. Um from like a branding standpoint, but then also, you know, how to, uh, how to, how to tie that decor in, um, simultaneously was definitely like, uh, kind of tricky. And I've never had, I've never, this was my first time ever doing that. So a lot of it was just mood boarding, you know, looking at different types of brands ranging from food brands to fashion brands, to beauty brands, and, and kind of honing in on our own brand identity from a, a logo color, all that, um, standpoint, and then the design, it was kind of like we we started working with our, our like um, architect who also was our interior designer and telling them, telling him, hey, this is what we have going on from a branding perspective. How do we align this with the store? So that was a really fun process. But I will say that I was much more hands on in the design of the second one. So actually being able to like source the the furniture we really wanted um to have final dis like say on the color of the tables of the 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 actual um what do you call it the material of the surfaces all that you know that was very important to me whereas the first time i it was my first go ahead and so i just didn't want to step on his toes i, I kind of want to to let the expert sort of lead the way. And then this time around, I was like, no, I know my brand more than anybody else. I need to make sure that um, I have final say over every single element that happens in the space. So um, that's, it takes some time. I, I will say even like the first time, if you're not really savvy when it comes to interior, interior design and, um, and even branding, um, it's, it's hard to match it up to the point where it's perfect. You know, it really takes some time to, to refine it. If you're not, um, 
well versed in it. And I was not well versed in it. But, you know, as time goes on, you just realize, okay, I know my brand inside and out. Let's go. I, I got this, this one. It must have been a pretty thrilling moment to see that actually come to life, you know, from when you were mood boarding and, and coming up with your thoughts and how you wanted it to look and feel for that flagship store and then actually, you know, unveiling this thing and walking in and being like, I did this. You know, this is crazy. It was a wild day. Yeah. No, I like we uh, did a whole ribbon uncutting uh, for our launch party and I full on I did like a little speech and I full on like burst into tears. I was like, I never thought I would be that person. But here I am. <laughs> um, it is wild when you I mean, it was it, it's one store into a lot of big companies that like one store is like whatever, because they are used to doing this volume of of um, real estate transactions and, and, uh, store openings. But for us, it was like the, the, the main thing that was going to solidify us as a company. And, um, it was a big moment. I mean, it was, it was a long, t it was in the works for a very long time. Like the build out wasn't as long maybe as you would think, but the actual process of, Find, like being so we were reached out to by the landlords and then they were kind of trying to you know uh i guess what's the word that i'm looking for not seduce us that's not right <laughs> but they were trying to like entice us to come um to actually you know take the take the risk and and enter their their space and you know it took a lot of convincing i'd say for us to actually go for it. And it took a long time to fundraise for it. So it was just a lot of anticipation, I'd say. Um, and then of course, about a little under a year of building it as well. So, and then here we are. And then here we are. That's crazy. On the topic of fundraising, I always love to ask how a brand finance or how a business was financing in the very beginning. So when you were first, you know, coming up with the idea, you and Adam are like, yep, this is this place that we want to bring to life. What was the process in terms of like savings or loans or financing from the very beginning? Yeah, the process is pretty much um, getting to work from a research standpoint, putting together a business plan simultaneously. Um, we were doing a lot of uh, real estate scouting um, at the same time. We were also doing a lot of research um, into um, competitors, I guess, um, even though we don't have like direct competitors, but like understanding the nail industry, understanding the massage and spa industry, and even the cafe industry. So, um, getting a better sense for what our margins are going to be. Um, and of course, putting together your financials based on that and, and coming up with pricing and, um, all that. And then based on where you end up with, um, all that you you kind of put your deck together and get to get to work. We've only really um, have done friends and family and angels up until this day. We've raised about a million total, um, but that's really just to power the stores. So um, X amount for flagship, X amount for the LES location. Um, the rest of the business has been pretty much bootstrapped. Um, so that's something I'm pretty proud of, you know, of course, because we haven't raised institutional capital yet. And, um, I think there's a different, um, there are different expectations with your business when, when you do that. And I'm not saying we're not going to do it. It's just, um, it's kind of cool to have gotten this far without it, but, uh, we did have a fair amount of friends and family that have invested in, um, Adam's bars prior to opening up Chill House. So we went out to them first, of course, as people that we knew that were interested in doing um, smaller investments. And to be honest, I mean, it's mostly just a lot of um, people that we're very good friends with that are in our immediate, like, you know, network um, that have given anywhere from 10 to 50 grand. And, you know, it doesn't, it may sound like a lot to some, but, you know, I think you'd be surprised how many people are just ready to, to make these smaller investments. And so, um, it was really interesting when I kind of realized that I, I went out to a few friends and people were like, Oh yeah, of course I want to invest in you. I'm like, Oh, amazing. Okay. So I never thought that I had friends that had that kind of money, like just sitting around in the bank. But, um, as soon as you start talking about it, you, you'd be surprised how many people are actually really interested in, and almost like flattered. Um, I'd say that you consider them or ask them. Right. So, um, that's how we fundraise for the most part. And then of course it's extended past our network. We've asked people if they know anybody that would be like a good uh, fit from like, uh, 
you know, more of like an advisor type standpoint. Um, so we've brought on a l- lot of really amazing founders, um, entrepreneurs that have done similar sort of um, not similar businesses, but have been down this road before, you know, that can kind of help us guide us in the right direction. Um, so we just, we have an incredible group of investors and I feel like for us loans, we never really went down that road. Um, and I do feel like doing friends and family, at least for me, um, sort of, you have a built in community that already supports you and is there for you. And that you can bounce ideas back and forth with. Right. So I think that for us was super helpful versus having going to a bank and being like, give us a million dollars and you won't hear from us until we're ready to pay you back. You know, so that that's not that's not something to me that um, excites me. Um, I like the collaboration aspect of having um, people that I can call partners, you know, so that's that's pretty much that was it. And so a lot of people they just, uh, they went for it. <laughs> oh, I love that. And it also further kind of like builds this notion of this community that you've been building, you know, your whole, your whole brand is built on community and bringing people into these spaces, but you're also doing that within your own community, which is a really nice way to, um, to think about it. I read that one of your mentors, uh, in the beginning was Sophia Amoruso. Is she someone that you're talking about as one of the founders who was helping you in the beginning? Would you be able to tell us a little bit about how that came about and how she was able to help you? My God, that's such a crazy story. That was probably like, I, I feel like she probably thinks I'm such a psycho anytime I share this, this story, because Um, I was always a huge fan of hers. I was a nasty gal shopper when I was younger in my early twenties. And she was like an entrepreneur I could actually relate to, you know, she didn't have a fancy pedigree, uh, you know, college education or anything like that. It was more so that she just kind of went, went with her gut, with her intuition, and she just worked her ass off and she was unapologetic about her personality. She was unapologetic about her leadership. I just love that she was super raw. And I've anyway, so I followed her for so long. And at one point prior to launching Chill House, um, I ended up on a trip for her girl boss, uh, Netflix, I guess, promotional. It was a promotional trip that influencers and media were invited to. So I luckily, uh, my friend, Alyssa Coscarelli, she, um, she couldn't go. And she's like, I put you up for it. Would you want to go? And I'm like, you have way more followers than me. Sure. If they want me, I'll I'll happily go. I'm obsessed with Sophia. And then there was also this like Chelsea Handler episode that she was going to be on. So I'd get to meet Chelsea. It was, it was unreal. Um, but obsessed with both women, of course. So off I go and I get to interview her and everything. So, but I'm amongst like 50 girls or something insane that she had to meet that day. Um, And then fast forward like a year and a half later, and I've noticed that like, you know, it was a crazy year when we opened up Chill House. We had an influx of followers that range from celebrities to founders and entrepreneurs that I really admired. So it was definitely like a very wild time in my life where I was like, wow, there's so much attention happening. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know how to feel about all this, but cool, like very flattered. Um, So I did notice at one point that she followed me and she followed Chill House. And I was like, whoa, big step big step. You're like, this I is don't know cool. where she follows me back. <laughs> this is so cool. I have the attention of my favorite entrepreneur of all time. Um, and then I'll never forget this. At one point it was just a random day. Um, we had, we had a party, uh, that canceled last minute at chill house. And, and this is like back when maybe we were still figuring things out. we like, didn't have the, her credit card on file, whatever. It was sloppy. We didn't have a system for when people canceled last minute, you know, these sort of parties last minute. And it was, it was a lot of money that we had lost because she decided to cancel last minute and there were no, there were no repercussions. And I just took to Instagram, Instagram stories. It was like early Instagram story days. And I started complaining about this situation. I was like, 
please, like, if you ever find yourself like wanting to cancel, like, please consider the business. It's like so disrespectful to do this last minute, blah, blah, blah. And it's not like me to complain about customers anymore. But in the beginning, I was very sassy because <laughs> I was dealing with so much, you know, and I'm still dealing with so much. But luckily now I have people that deal with their own individual individual customer service concerns, right? I have, I have a lot of people that um, it, it, it gets to them first. But at in the beginning, I, it was kind of coming to me first. And I was like, ah. Um, so yeah, she was like, DMs me as I'm complaining. She's like, I love what you're doing. Let's talk. I'm like, of course you love what I, of course you DM me when I'm like complaining about customers. That's such a Sophia thing to do. <laughs> and that was amazing. That was like, okay, I must be doing something right. Like this is, you know, part of being an entrepreneur is being vulnerable and, 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 sharing these sides of, uh, what happens on a regular basis. And anyway, so she really took a liking to that, I guess, and DM'd me, decided to DM me in that moment. And that's kind of when, um, I feel like a lot of things changed for us. We really, we realized that we were more than that little store that we had the opportunity to, to really take things to the next level. We had the attention of some really notable people and yeah, she, um, she came on board. Um, we ended up flying to LA and went to her house and, and chatted with her and she became an advisor and investor, um, shortly after that. So, and then, yeah, we've had that, was, you know, that's her, just having her, um, to bounce ideas off of ha has been incredible. So, um, she's one of the few, like, yes, uh, really badass entrepreneurs that we have. Um, and it's just, it's, it was a wild story. And I just was like, what is happening? <laughs> that has got to be the coolest thing ever. That is like the ultimate fangirl moment for an entrepreneur in, you know, today's world. Um, obviously having followed her, like her career and everything, that's just so cool. Congratulations. Wow. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. It was a really crazy moment for me. I just never knew that I would manifest that. It's just very bizarre. And she's, she doesn't, she doesn't reach out to, I mean, she's very, um, she's very supportive of female businesses and all that, of course. I mean, she's made a whole career out of it, but I was her, we were her first advisor, uh, role and her first investment, I think. Oh, wow. Cool. That is really interesting. That's so cool. I want to switch gears and talk now about your marketing and the launch, especially in those early days when you were just getting started and you needed to spread that word and put in that grassroots hustle, I guess. And I'm sure you still do it today, but you know, that, that early time when things are up in the air, how did you launch and how were you putting the word out there? Our launch strategy was to be a little, um, I guess, secretive in the beginning because um, we were doing something completely unique and um, we didn't want to kind of come out and say exactly what we were doing. We wanted to keep uh, things a bit of a mystery to to keep people on our t on their toes. So, um, yeah, we I, I formed an Instagram maybe. I don't know, I want to say like six months prior to actually launching. And it was just a really pretty feed of things that symbolize self-care. Um, they gave people a good idea of what our brand was going to be. Um, I started asking people to follow and it just kind of quickly gained a little bit of speed. We ended up with about, I want to say seven or 8,000 followers um, prior to even opening up our doors. And then by the time we opened up our doors, people were like ready to come in, you know? So we were teasing it out and, and I think giving people a little bit of, a little bit of a tease into what we were doing. Um, and then I think by the time we opened, they were just like, wow, this is cool. You know? Cause they were, obviously we didn't want to let them down. Like, um, oh, well, we're, we only do this and you can't come or you, you have, it's not that exciting. People were very excited. Um, we also had a PR team that I, I think did a really exceptional job. Um, but you know, for our launch, um, we ended up on all the major New York outlets and and all of like our favorite beauty outlets. And and I think that definitely certainly helped. Um, and then you know, of course, I, I definitely relied on a lot of like my digital influencer friends to come come by, share the space, and get services and get the word out. Um, so that, I think that little, that hybrid, um, definitely got us to that next step. And yeah, I mean, New Yorkers are, I mean, prior to the pandemic, I mean, even now we're just so, um, we're so curious and we love experience more than anything, right? That's why we live here. We don't live here to sit in our homes all day. So I think if there's something cool 
that's like visual and, you know, obviously a place where you can go take care of yourself and, and drink a delicious drink that's also pretty and go get a massage and feel good afterwards, like, of course, people are going to show up. So it was really the concept, I feel like more than anything that sold itself <laughs> at the end of the day. But um, of course, the hybrid of um, marketing, sort of that whole mix, um, certainly got the word out. And how has that kind of evolved given, you know, COVID and last year and this year being so weird? What's the what's working for you now when it comes to acquiring new people, especially for online? I know that you guys are doing a really big push with your your chill tips, which are just the coolest things absolutely ever. How's how's all that working and what what's kind of driving the growth for you these days? Good question. Um, it's definitely a new playing field for me, um, being more on the digital side of things, you know, cause we have the one location in New York city and a lot of people already know us. Um, so we have that, we have a membership. So we have members that come in monthly for their services. Um, we also have people that just come in and, and get their like, you know, buy monthly massages or, or facials or whatever it is that they enjoy coming to get, uh, get at chill house. Um, but even that we, we run some, dig, some ads on Instagram and Facebook just to, you know, make sure we're reminding people that we're there and, um, obviously acquiring new people that may be new to New York city or just don't know us because they hadn't, you know, we haven't made their, our name hasn't made their way to their, um, <laughs> circle. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of that going on for tips. Um, uh, the biggest thing for us has been digital ads, I'd say, just because, um, you do hit a wall sometimes when it's just you're talking to just your own customer. Um, so you need to think about that next step, right? What's how do I acquire new customers? How do I um, make sure I'm not just kind of like sitting with with the people that already know us? Um, so that's been a big part of our growth, I'd say. And uh, continuing to gift. Um, luckily, we have a very visual product, you know, and people even we don't, we send things out without any expectations for the most part, but just like everyone obviously knows we're sending you a gift. We hope that you can share it on social. A lot of times girls just like end up with the tips on their hands and they talk a lot into the camera and they're doing this. And then it's like word of mouth. And so we have a lot of that happening too, which is quite cool because that's something that there are like no limits, I think with products, which is what's really exciting. You know, you can create something and then you never know where it's going to, take you. I mean, like, who knows, our tips could be picked up in some retailer in Japan one day or, or Europe, you know, it's, there are no limits. Um, so that's been really fun. And yeah, and we're now carried in, um, urban outfitters. We were in Nordstrom. We have a few retailers we're in talks with. I don't want to talk about it too much, but, um, our biggest one is urban. And so we're going to be in stores, um, across the country and in the U S hopefully one day in London and Europe. Um, I would love to see that. Um, so that also opens up new doors, you know, people that just have never heard of you before. And they're like, what's chill house. They make cool tips and let me check out their website. You know, it's this new level of discovery that is so new to us just because we've always been the brand that it's just like, come to us, come to us. It's just chill house, you know, and we have other things that we have other products from other brands that we, we carry and we promote, but, um, it was always about the chill house experience. And now that we are actually entering other doors, it's about, um, hopefully us, you know, entering now their lives. And then now they become customers. They, we acquire a new customer for life because they loved our tips and then they, they become fans and they maybe shop other things down the road, whether that's through urban or that's through us directly. So that's a new level of discovery that I've actually um, never really embarked on, which is really fun. Totally. And it's really that it's that cult item. It's something that, you know, it's so social media focused. It's that thing that brings people from all over the world to be interested. And then the day they're in New York, they're like, well, obviously I've got to go to chill house. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, love that. That's so cool. When you look back on your, you know, the success that you've had over the last few years building this brand, what do you attribute that success to? I think the biggest thing has been just 
again, sort of our transparency and just our voice overall. Our voice is very lighthearted. Um, again, we don't take ourselves too seriously, uh, but we're there for you. We're kind of like, I love how you described your podcast. It's kind of like, talk. well, for us, it's talking to your big sister, I think, uh, or like we're like your big sister and we're there for you. And we're we're going to keep it real and we're going to tell you what it is, but we also um, would give you a big hug at the end sort of thing, you know? Um, similar to what you were saying, like you just meet at a bar and you're talking to like someone that just happens to know her shit. Like, I love that. Um, it's very similar in that sense. So I think our voice, um, in addition to our visuals and like what we represent and, and our services and the staff, the team, the, the people behind the brand, um, I think also continues to transcend past you know what we actually do. So um, that is the big sort of differentiator, I'd say, um, between Chill House and any other sort of self-care brand out there. Um, and something that we're seeing now a lot more, like a lot of brands are really starting to embrace this this type of um, identity. Um, and I feel like we were definitely one of the first in, in our space, at least. So I think it's, it's most, it's that, you know, it's definitely that. And then of course, it's, the people that they form like actual relationships with these, these individuals and they um, are so loyal to them, you know, to the point where we've definitely had people that have left and like, then we've had customers that have either left with them or just are like, I, I was so loyal to this, you know, to this individual. So uh, I may not be coming back. And um, obviously uh, we want to make sure that everyone does come back and, and kind of loves the brand even without a, a person being associated to it. But um, it's been a huge part of our growth too, I'd say. Just that um, that loyalty to either individuals behind the company or the actual brand and what it represents as well. I love that. That's such a cool thing to have and to know that people are so connected to what you're doing and it's not just, you know, the beauty salon that you that doesn't have a name kind of thing, for sure. Well, well, thinking about today where the brand is and what's for the future, can you shout about some cool things that are going on right now that people should know about? Ooh, well, we have a lot of really exciting um, launches in the pipeline. Um, One coming in March, a big one, um, I'd say face and body related. So I know we, we launched last year our press-ons and those are going really well. You'll obviously continue to see new designs. Um, but now it's time to kind of embark on some new categories. So face and body, as you know, we do massages and we do facials. So we'll start playing around uh, with products in those categories um, and really trying to help people, um, if they can't make it to Chill House, recreate some of these experiences at home in some way. So I'll just kind of leave it at that. But that's really our entire um, mission is giving people um, more ways to bring the chill home. You know, even like from the clothes that we create to the candles, we, you know, we're always kind of testing out new candle options. And um, obviously now like our bigger sort of formulated products, but I'd say there are a good amount of formulated products in the works this year. So um, you'll see a lot of really fun, nerdy, new, cool stuff from Chill House. (laughs) Ooh, I'm very excited. I will be obviously keeping my eyes peeled and cheering for you on the sidelines, for you on the sidelines rather. What advice do you have for women who have a big idea and want to launch their own business? I would say stop second guessing yourself. Um, The biggest differentiator I find between men and women is that men just do and women um, talk a lot about their ideas and try to get um, feedback and try to get advice and and all that. And all that's good. I'm not saying that's a bad thing thing but men just do they don't ask questions they just go for it and um i think i want to see more women just having that sort of innate reaction when it comes to something that they think about if it feels like a brilliant idea to you then it should be a brilliant idea to everyone because i mean you're you're you know what's needed right you know if it's something that like you actually need there are probably millions of people out there that probably need it too unless it's something so freaking specific that like may not make sense, of course. But, you know, I think for the most part, we're, we're all smart enough to know what, what, um, 
what's actually missing and what's what's not and what would actually sell and what, what wouldn't. So that's my, my biggest thing. I find that so many women um, just second guess themselves a lot. And I just wish that we just trusted our gut more. So the biggest, I guess, feedback or the biggest advice would be just trust your gut. Um, and as far as it, you think it could take you. And I think there are many specific things that we have to be like, I can't trust my gut here. I actually have to seek out an expert and knowing how to differentiate those two are, is very key to, to making those moves and, and moving forward with that next step for sure. Yeah, that's a good one. Trying to figure out where you can run fearlessly towards the fire and where you should seek advice and seek some counsel. Like, I don't know anything about legal or licenses or anything. So I'm obviously not going to, yeah. <laughs> Represent yourself in the, in yeah, the, in no. the courtroom. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> um, at the end of every episode, I ask every woman that I speak to six quick questions. And some of it we might have already touched on, but, you know. For for the sake of all the six questions, I do this so at rapid the end. Fire. I mean, it doesn't need to be rapid, rapid fire, but it's just the same six questions that I asked to everyone. So question number one is, what's your why? Why do you do what you do? I do what I do because I create experiences that I want for myself, truly. There is nothing that I've done that I, I wasn't like, I need this. So my why is to create a better lifestyle for myself as selfish as that sounds. Um, because I know if I'm creating a better lifestyle for myself, I'm creating a better lifestyle for other uh, people in our community. Mm, so true. So true. Question number two is what do you think has been the number one marketing moment that's made your business pop? We've had so many random ones. Um, I mean, we haven't had like Justin Bieber poster tips or anything like that. <laughs> but, uh, but we were on the Today Show not too long ago. Um, the editor-in-chief of Allure, she, uh, Michelle Lee, she talked about our tips so that we saw like our traffic and our sales spike um, incredibly high like that one day, which was really cool. So I guess that was the last one that I we felt was like a big, big success for us. Mm, that's a good one. Question number three is where are you hanging out to get smarter? What books are you reading, podcasts are you listening to, or newsletters that you're subscribing to? I'm getting smarter weirdly through like, this is may not sound that smart, but think content like TikTok and like really random content that just I end up landing on. I think the algorithm is getting smarter and smarter and they're realizing I don't necessarily need the fluffy stuff. And I'm starting to actually learn a lot in very bite-sized content, which for me works right now. Um, so yeah, I've been getting um, fed a lot of like five tips to do this, or here are some tricks for this platform and, or here are some, yeah, you know, whatever the, the content may be. Um, and I'm saving a lot of that. And, and we're talking a lot about like a lot of these things that I'm learning and we're all learning. Um, around the, the office, AKA our Google Hangouts. So um, I'd say that right now, and I'm not always on Clubhouse, but I'm starting to become more curious. Um, and I, I end up on chats every now and then that are very smart. And um, obviously I follow really interesting people on there. So I like the idea of Clubhouse. I haven't fully like sucked the Kool-Aid yet, but um, I do think there there is a lot of value to be found there as well. Mm, I feel the same about Clubhouse. I haven't totally nailed it yet, but when I'm like poking in and out, I have received some cool value from like other cool speakers. But when it comes to TikTok, I am so obsessed. And I literally also just think to myself, I learned the craziest stuff. Like just before I saw this video and it was like, hey, here's the best way to clean your blender. Like after you make a smoothie, you just put the dishwasher liquid in it and turn it on. And it cleans it and then you just rinse it out. It like zhuzhes it all up. So it takes all the fruit off the side. And I was like, shut up. This is the coolest thing. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I mean, we don't have to be learning, I don't know, the the craziest stuff, you know, from these like long podcasts or anything. I mean, of course, I think there's a difference if you really need to hone in on a skill, um, then there are good places to do that. But on a day to day, I feel like we, we are getting a lot of that content on the socials that we're already on and, and we're like digesting a combination of really fun, easygoing, lighthearted stuff, but then also like tangible tips on how to do things um, that we never even knew we needed 
or, you know, or how to grow our socials or whatever it is that we actually do need. Um, so I, I love that about just what the algorithm's doing, which I know I shouldn't like and now the algorithm but in a way I'm like keep keep doing this I'm into it yeah me too me too question number four is how are you winning the day at the moment what are your am or pm rituals that keep you feeling happy and successful and motivated my best days are really the days that I go to sleep early I know it sounds like so like typical but it's the days that I go to sleep early and I wake up early and I hang out with my baby um I have like a solid like hour with him and I actually like have a bit of a routine with him and then feed him and then also kind of like feed myself and my husband we're, we're, you know, it just, that to me, that whole sort of baby cooking breakfast, drinking like your matcha in the morning. I never knew I'd have that to be completely honest. I was always like prior to having a child and prior to the pandemic where we were running to the office, it was like, I'd get out of bed at like nine o'clock and then I was like out the door and then I barely make it to the office by 10. It was always just like a rush And it's so nice to actually like go to sleep early and wake up and have like a normal night's sleep every now and well, it's not always because we still, you know, have a baby that's six and a half months old, of course. So it's not, it's not perfect every day, but the days that it is, it feels so good. And those are always the days that I'm the most productive and, um, I get a lot done and I feel really good about our life, you know, what we've built and and having that moment to ourselves. Um, and night, um, Similarly, I like were it's crazy. I never thought I would say this stuff. Um, but we like put them down at seven and like we, you know, pop open a bottle of wine and my husband cooks and we throw on a movie or a TV show and that's it. And like we just chill and we have like a very normal, nice night in. And of course I love to dine out and, and all that too. Um, but I always find that those days are just the best when things are just calm around the house, you know, and I just feel so relaxed. Question number five is if you only had a thousand dollars left in your business bank account, where would you spend it? I mean, if I'm trying to survive and get our sales back up, which is what I'm thinking of it in this capacity, it would be towards um, making sure I'm working with the people that we already have in our network or community, um, gifting people that I know can amplify um, our products and our services and begging them to to help us out so that we don't go out of business. I think that's the biggest thing. Like use the people that already love you and care about you um, in those moments. Um, that was the first thing we did during the pandemic. We're like, people, community, we need you. And they came through for us. So always look to the people com- like right in front of you. And of course, like, you know, the bigger people with the bigger audiences to, um, to help you get back on your feet. That's, we've had to do it already. We didn't have a thousand dollars in our bank account. We had more than that, but we certainly have had to think that way in the past. Getting the people who really are already cheerleading for you. And last question, question number six is how do you deal with failure? What's your mindset and approach when things aren't going so well? I luckily have a pretty good outlook on failure. I've failed multiple times. I don't come from much. Yeah, I don't, I mean, this is my first business that if we failed, it would definitely be like, ugh. but I look at like individual little failures inside, um, within like launches or within certain initiatives that we have going on. If they didn't really pop off, it's like, oh, okay, we tried it. Um, so I look at failure, like it, it's, it's fine to test it. Of course, test, test whatever you think is going to work. And if it doesn't land, then now, you know. And, and it's, it's always a game of trial and error. Um, I mean, chill house is one company, but we, I like to think that we have a bunch of mini companies happening within, you know, our our day to day, just because we have so much going on and, um, all these launches could be individual companies on their own. So, yeah, I mean, I think certainly like never get so emotionally attached to something is, um, uh, I think that's super important because when you do, that's when it failure hits you the hardest. I think they're always go into things knowing that there could be a possibility that it doesn't pop off. But a lot of times you just kind of like end up learning and knowing what will work and what won't for your company. Um, so I hope that we don't have many failures moving forward, but we have, and and we just kind of learn and grow. Mm, I really love that. What you just said about 
don't get too attached, too personally attached to something in case it doesn't work. I think that's a really great insight and a good thing for people to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cindy, thank you so much for taking the time to be on Female Startup Club today. I have loved chatting with you and I am such a cheerleader of everything that you've been doing. So I will be following along and watching all these exciting launches. You're so sweet. Thank you. I'll have to get you some tips. Even though we're not available out there yet, I'll make sure we get you some. (laughs) Thank you.